Okay, cool. So now a bit delayed. New binders for Isabel. Okay, so uh, as outlined, I will first speak why I'm doing this at all. Why am I bothering with this? Um, then what are the different ways that different theorem provers represent binders? Um, then what is the core of the whole thing? Um, let me just make this a bit smaller so we don't have this in the way. Um, which is a net restricted bounded natural functor. Then how we can write data types as a composition of these uh, MRV nets. Um, then create proper recursive data types of those, uh, out of those. Deal with of equivalence, get the nice induction principles we want that have the variable convention built in. And in the end, how to de define capture volume substitution. So first, uh, my personal motivation for all of this is I want to uh, formalize in my PhD, I want to formalize system FC as it is used for Haskell core uh, in Isabel. And I want to extend that uh, then with row types uh, so we can eventually get row types in Haskell itself. Um, the problem is with this, I started formalizing system F uh, in, in Isabel with nominal two and hit some roadblocks. Yeah, so the background of this is, um, so Isabel is an interactive theorem prover, um, mainly developed at, um, at TUM and at, <coughs> and uh, uh, by Lauren Paulson. It, uh, it is based on classical logic in, uh, in compared to, for example, Koch or Agda with the race independent types. Um, and it is very strongly encourages you to derive everything from its very simple core pieces. So there are no built-in data types in Isabel at all um, compared to other theorem provers. They are all defined basically by type nets, which are subtypes uh, of larger types defined by some predicate. And it, it does feature high level proof language that make, at least in my opinion, reading proofs a lot easier than a low level tactic scripts that you have in other theorem provers. Um, and you can write custom tactics in um, normal standard ML. So no weird proof language. So what does an Isabel theory look like? Uh, this is just a simple example. Um, type constructors are written post fix, which is uh, like the ML way to do it. So in Haskell, this type would be written as C and not AC. Um, expressions are in, in the in the term language are quoted. Um, the rest is just Isabel syntax and not uh, like terms in Isabel. Um, they can be omitted for for a single uh, lexemes. And it does feature a lot of very powerful proof automation. So Isabel is very good at automating parts or even complete proof, which comes by sledgehammer that try to invoke external theorem provers to do the work for you. But none of these commands you see there, like the function command to define function or the data that command is built in. The only thing that is really built in is booleans and then in, uh, and the one infinite type that you can use to make natural numbers. And everything else is derived from there and uh, with the help of the choice operator. So, at the second part is what is we do, what we currently have. We have several approaches to uh, reasonable finders, nameless finders like the Brown indices, um, embedded syntax, like higher order abstract syntax, and mainful approaches, for example, nominal logic. Uh, in nameless, we have some pros. The nice thing about uh, the Brown indices is that alpha equivalence is just the same as syntactic equivalent. There are no variable names, um, so you don't need to uh, care about renamings. But the cons are uh, substitution is a bit more involved because we need to shift all the binders in the terms you are substituting for. And uh, it is hard to implement more complex binding schemes like a lead rec or something like that. Um, in higher order abstract syntax, we basically reuse the binding mechanism of the host language. So here, if we have this, it's like in a Haskell-like language, we use Haskell lambdas to express our binding uh, scheme, which is nice because we don't need to deal with that again. Um, and this might be a pro or a con with this organization. Every term is guaranteed to be closed. 
Um, but the problem is it is very hard to then introspect like the body of a function because this is now a somewhat opaque function. It's not just syntax. And the other thing is it is very hard to express binders that are more complicated than the host language supports. Um, depends on what you're formalizing. This might be relevant or not. So if we have a nameful approach, variables are just expressed, for example, as strings. Um, this is very familiar to readers. Uh, we have been doing this in math classes our entire life. Um, and we can deal with any arbitrary complex binders. The problem on that is if we need to really reason about alpha equivalence, and ideally we want some induction principles that give us alpha equivalence and give us fresh variables in the induction as well. And depending on which flavor of meaningful approaches you take, it might require that you only use bijections for variable renamings, uh, which is also uh, a bummer uh, for um, certain problems. So in Isabel, the status quo of automating all of that is uh, nominal two. Um, it is available in the archive of formal truth, so it's very easy to use. Um, and it provides a quotient <laughs> type for that you can construct to get an alpha equivalent term type. So that is one thing you don't need to do, deal about the alpha equivalence of two terms. So from, from the user perspective, this is exactly like the brown indices. Two terms are equal if they are alpha equivalent. It does give you nice induction principles where you can avoid arbitrary sets of variables. Um, it does support complex binders, which is exactly what this paper is about. And to get the problem start with if you define function, you can define binder functions, but also avoid um, and don't capture variables. The problem is that these require some lengthy proofs uh, about equivariance and other correctness properties. Uh, that are very hard to do. The other thing is you can only pattern match on those uh, quotient types inside these functions, which uh, increases the problem a lot because you need to do that a lot. And um, the other thing is that it's just really hard to know is compatibility, uh, compatibility with normal data types. So Isabel, as you saw, highest data types not built in, but there's a code for that. You can't use them. And um, the other thing is you can only use finite data types. Um, so you can't use it for anything that involves infinite data type or types of infinite support. Um, the support of a function is defined as all the values that the function changes. So it is the identity of all the values that are not in the support. So to exemplarize this thing a bit more, this is how nominal two we would have to define in that way. You see here, I'm using this absolutely A list type um, that I have to define mutually cursor here. I would actually want to define this as just a list of pairs that I find, like the first component of the pair. But I can't do that. You see, like how the syntax highlighting uh, says that. Um, so this is the way you have to do it in, uh, in nominal two, which requires you to also in all your proofs always do simultaneous induction. Um, so you can't factor out parts of the proof into a separate proof. You can't reuse proofs. So all the nice, like Isabel has a very rich standard library about lists. Uh, so, but you can't use that because you have an A-list here, not your normal list type, which is a bummer. And even more than that, instead of using a list of pairs, you would actually want to use something like a distinct association list, which is basically a quotient on lists that uh, makes sure that the first part in the pair is never is, is different in the real list. So you don't have duplicate variable names, and normal two is not able to express that at all. So the question is now, how can we get this definition to work? And um, there was at Pop Over 2019 was this paper. Um, I'm working together with Dimitri now to make this a reality. And the approach is to basically they represent uh, the binding relation as the, uh, the, the types as a fixed point of a class of well behaved functors. And the nice thing about this, this is only a semantic criteria. So, as long as you can prove those axioms for this specific class of uh, axioms, this thing can be used as a binding data type. It doesn't need to be a data type in the classical sense. Uh, the one con is it requires a lot of proof automation because it is very uh, complex. 
So that's what I'm working on at the moment. So um, for the definition of a natural bounded natural function, this is the base version. It's what the current Isabel data types are based off. Uh, so for any type f, it, it, it has to be a type constructor, and you categorize the variables, uh, the, the positions on the of this type in two categories. One, this will be this y. Day. We call them y. They are part of the function. This is why they are also here in the map function. The other part, they are we call them that. They're not part of the functor, they're just carried around. Um, so, of course, we, to be a functor, we need a map function. So, we map over um, the live positions and get one type, and we can map this to the other type with a different content. Um, so, the, the natural, uh, the, the bounded natural part comes, come on, yes. We also need uh, so called set functions. And one for every live position. And they extract basically all the elements out of the type. So you can see this as if you know container types or see this type as a container of elements of type Y. The set function should extract all of the elements of type Y out into a set. Gamma. Yeah, yeah, gamma, sorry. Gamma. Yeah, out in a set. So for a list, it just takes all the elements in the list and gives you a set with all the elements in the list. And um, it also requires that's where the bounded part comes in. It requires a cardinal bound uh, that has to be infinite. So it needs to be at least under zero. Can be higher for infinite data types as well. What's the BD here? Uh, that's just bound. So we need to define map, set, and bound for a given data type. And however we define them, defines what data type we're going to be looking at. But just this is the bound of the, the functor, the cardinal bound. Mm -hmm. um, we have some axioms. Of course, it needs to be a functor, so it needs to reflect identity and composition. Uh, it also needs to be congruent only on the elements that these set functions uh, return. So if F and G agree on the elements of their particular set, then the whole map must agree. Yeah. Yeah. You can leave this question for later, or you can answer yeah. now. Um, are there naturally occurring functors for which that precondition on the set restriction actually has force? So for lists, you would want it always to be yeah, the yeah, case. Yeah. But what's a, what's a good example where where you really use that condition in anger? Um, I think this condition is just to make this axiom a bit weaker, so you can sure. differentiate it to for more types. Yeah, I was just wondering what. Yeah, there is. I don't know of anything that okay. would occur by default. Um, yeah. Usually, this is always the case. But often, you need this because some things are only defined on a given set. So, this might. So, for example, the three variable functions we will see later, we can we'll probably only be able to implement it for this because this will then, this, the set function will be the three variable function. And then it's only defined on the three variables. Um, the natural part comes from uh, this axiom, which requires the functor to be uh, to have a natural transformation to the power set functor, which basically just means if you map over something and then take a set, should be the same as if you take the set first and then you just image the f over that set. Um, so yeah, if you map the whole data type and then extract all the elements, should be the same as extracting all the elements first and then imaging the function over it. And this is also the bounded part. We require that all of the set functions are bounded, strictly bounded by our cardinal bound. Okay, so to make this a bit easier, what are some examples of DNFs? So one very easy example is the sum type. Um, and okay, there's some missing, that's just the product type. Um, and here I want to again stress that this is not, there's no data types by default in Isabel. So this is not defined as a data type with like a left and right constructor. This is actually how the sum type is defined in Isabel in the standard library, very deep in the standard library. And it's basically this set comprehension here. So even though that this is not a data type in a classical sense, so this is it's a subtype, a, a subtype of this, uh, of the whole universe of types. 
um, we still can prove those axioms for this constructions and then get a data type out of it, uh, which is also the strong part about it. Um, yeah, another thing we can do is uh, the function error, which has two, uh, like this has two type parameters, but they are different because with those, they are both live because we can map over both of them. But with the function error, we have one dead variable because of the negative position in the function error and one live variable. Uh, so we will only have one set function for those and we will have two set functions for those. Because the set number of set functions always equal to the number of life positions on the function. Um, and this is for the, exactly as again from the pulled from the Isabel Senate library, the, the thing that in I just added some type of signatures for clarity um, that instantiates this, this the function arrow as a DNS. So you see it that you can use composition as a map function, and then the range of a function. Is the set function we pull out all the Bs from the function basically, and at the cardinal bound we are at least we are using a left zero depending on how big the universe of the input is. This might get solved in this uh, cardinal addition. And some other we need later for the composition is the identity counter. So we have only one life position. Uh, our map function is the identity function of this type. The set is just a singleton set of that thing, and it has well, a left zero, the one is less than infinite. Um, and the same is the constant functor that is in the Isabel Sand library called dead ID, which only has one dead argument, so it's not part of the functor. So the again, so the map function does not have a mapping argument, it only has the later part here. So it is again the identity function, but at a different type. And it has no set functions because, again, set functions only work on the live positions. And another very indifferent example is, for example, this is uh, from the whole probability library. This is the probability mass function. And again, we can prove those axioms for this, which is, again, very much not a normal data type. But again, this is a syntactic, uh, it's not a syntactic criteria, but it's a semantic one. So this is, again, a data type. So now where can the map restriction uh, come? So if we generalize this definition of a BNF a little bit, we add two new kinds of variables here, uh, new positions on the functor. So we call these, this will be the ones we will later use for free variables. So we call them the free positions. And these ones we will later use for bound variables. So we use it as bound positions. The other ones do stay the same as for the BNF. So that's also why this is a generalization. And uh, data types without these two are just BNFs. Um, and the interesting part is that the map function is only working with endo functions on both of those. It still has normal any functions on the live positions. Uh, on top of that, the set functions do not change, but we also want to extract the sets from those three and bound positions in addition to the live positions. And this has not changed the bound, but we also require the types of those things to be bigger or equal to the cardinal bound. This is important because, as I said, we will later use this for the free and bound variables. And with this uh, restriction, we can we always have enough free variables available because our set functions need to be smaller than the cardinal bound. And if our the type of the variables is either or equal to the cardinal boundary, there are always enough fresh variables available for us to use. Um, and the map restricted part then comes in with all the axioms. Every time there is a map function, the map function is only defined with those assumptions. So on the free positions, we require functions of small support. So again, support is the, the um, all the values the function changes or is not the identity on. And so that the, the cardinality of the type needs to be bigger than the support of the function. Um, in, uh, in, in nominal two, we have a similar one. We, in nominal two, everything requires finite support. This is just a straight generalization of this because if, if the type is not equal to LF0, uh, we can have higher support. For the bound positions, we also require the function to be bijection. So we don't accidentally capture variables if we don't need them to. We will get rid of this criteria uh, of this requirement later on with the fixed one. 
But uh, yeah, other than that, all the axioms are unchanged inside of every one of them has these assumptions added to them. Yeah, so we require small support endo functions for prepositions and small support automorphisms for bound positions. So now, how do we get a data type out of that? This is just now a nice mathematical object. We want a data type out of that. So um, if we take, let's start with the BNS again, this is how the normal data types work. If we have a, a list type, we can define it like this, but again, this is not built in. So Isabel allows you to associate a custom parser with a keyword. So as soon as it releases the command data type, it gives off to the data type library, and then data type library parses that however they want to. And internally, it creates uh, this pre data type, which uh, replaces the recursive occurrence of the type with another position on the functor and leaves the rest more or less unchanged. So instead of this or syntax, we use the sum type, this time with an infix instead of uh, with this normal name like earlier, and the product type if you have a conjunction of things. Um, for our binder data type, we do something similar. So if you this syntax does not exist yet, so I haven't implemented this parsing and syntax yet, but you can imagine. Um, so we have something like this. You have a, a, a untyped lambda calculus. Um, again, we leave the type of our variables open, and we want to bind like the variables in the terms in our lambda abstraction. Um, we create again a pre data type, but we do something else. So of course, we take we have to you take the, the like here the parameter needs to be on the functor, but if that parameter also appears under such a binding clause, we add a second basically a copy of it uh, to the position. We will later use this there as the three variables and this for the bound variables. And again, we replace the recursive occurrences with this with another argument. But again, if we have a recursive occurrence that appears under such a binding clause, we add another one that we can later use for a recursive occurrence that binds variables. So now this nice thing about this, this is all now position based. So I know that if I do anything to this, it will only affect the three variables. If I do anything to this, it will only affect the bound variables. And I can use this to see that this is where the parameters are bound. And the definition is like you would expect from this side, where we have basically the var, a conjunction of two recursive occurrences that do not bound, and then one binding occurrence of a variable and a binding recursive occurrence. And the nice thing about this is this really allows us to implement this type we saw earlier that didn't work in nominal two. Um, oh, sorry, this is that we, we keep note of which which of the positions binds which position. So the first of the bound position is now bound in the first of those like positions. This just we keep this on the side for later. Um, but this really makes it possible to implement such a leg rec like you saw earlier, because this is now again the same variable type and this here. And we can now say this this variable type again is part under a binding clause, and these two are recursive occurrences under a binding clause. And you see, we are recursing through another data type, and this is where the composition of the data types is really powerful. We can freely recurse, and this is even a quotient on normal lists. As long as we can prove the axioms for our data type, we can recurse through it and use it. Uh, so the translation is the same as before here. So the code I wrote starts at this point. So I expect the programmer to give me that at the moment until I have implemented this nice syntax. So then once we have this pre data type, we, uh, we want to, we need to prove the axioms. So we have now a very, a big composite type. And we want to know that this composite type is such a bounded natural functor or a macrospective bounded natural functor. And we can basically just go through the whole type and then always at every level, okay, we manually prove uh, that the sum type is a natural functor. We prove that the product type is a natural functor. And we already have, we can wrap them those in the identity type and everything we do not recognize. So it's neither a variable nor already a DNF we wrap in this constant functor. So a set is not a constant factor. We will be uh, not a DNF because we will not be able to prove the boundness axiom for any arbitrary set. 
we can prove that for finite or bounded sets, but not for the general, possibly arbitrarily infinite set. Um, then we need to adjust the positions. So um, by default, everything is live, but we want to use it later for variables, so we can demote down. Um, because the map function has basically in increasingly strict requirements for the different positions, we can only ever demote. We can go from live, which has no assumptions on the functions at all, to uh, free positions, which only require small support, to um, the bound positions, which require them also to be by Jackson. We can't go back because we can't, can't get rid of those extra assumptions. And um, then we basically, to make the composition easier, we make that all of them have the same, like if for, for one of the compositions, so this is the outer DNF and this is the inner DNF now, we make that they all have the same position because that makes the proofs a lot more predictable and maintainable. So basically, we, we add those dummy positions to that uh, functor. And then we can permute them so they have all the same uh, order. And then we can um, prove the, the whole axioms by composition. So we then take the, for example, then we define a map function. The map function for this whole thing is basically the composition of the map function for the outer thing composed with the map function of the inner thing. And then with those for those composed um, definitions, we can then prove the axioms based on the axioms of the smaller parts. So this was uh, my master thesis. And then I continued on that uh, later. Um, so this was implemented by different students. I just fixed some tactics and integrated it in the whole thing. So for a normal data type, we can take now the fixed point mm -hmm. of this data type. Um, to get a recursive data type. Um, and depending on which fixed point you use, either the least, uh, the, the smallest fixed point or the greatest fixed point, you get a normal finite data type or a infinite core data type. Yes? Sure. Is that new operating system you can actually get an interval or is it? Well, not like this. There it is. You can get it through code. So effectively, yes, there is okay. something like this, but it's not like the syntax at, at there. At the ML level. At the ML level, you can get that okay. if by calling into the data type package. Yeah. There's APIs for that. Excellent. Thank you. This just to make it a bit more nice on the eyes. And, and this gives us an, a constructor that takes this previous data type, instantiated with like a, the, the parameter type that is just taken with it, and the first occurrence and gives us a new list. And at that point, we're basically done. We can prove all the axioms uh, with um, in with the injection on this type and by uh, by induction or co-induction, depending on the type of data type. Um, yeah, but for our binding data type, we have a bit more to do. So if we have again our type, um, first we abbreviate this a bit. So we use the same type for both the bound and the free position. And we also use the same type for both of the recursive occurrences. Then we do construct a normal data type, so a normal fixed point on, on top of that. And later we just unfold this definition. So then we have a constructor that takes two variable positions and two recursive positions and gives us a new type. And we call this a raw type because there is no binding going on at the moment. This is just a normal recursive data type. Um, and all the variable binding comes afterwards. So first of all, we need to know what, what does free variables mean? And there, this, uh, this relation of what binds which is relevant. So we can uh, define an inductive predicate on which does mean to be a free variable. So if something is in this first, so the sets are just numbered from one to four. Uh, so the function that extracts all those positions is called set one, the function that calls those set two and so on. So if something is in this first set, they are all free by the things we said. We use this one, this position for the free variables. So if something is in this occurrence, we said this is, will be the position that contains the recursive part that bind variables. If it's in this set and it's free in there, and it's not in the second set because the bound variables, we want to, it's, if it's bound, it's not free anymore, then it's also free in the whole thing. And if it's this set is, is the recursive occurrence that do not bind variables. So if it's free in there, it's also free in the whole thing. And our free variables you can then define as the set of all variables such that they are free in X. 
which lets us derive basically a recursive definition of the thing. So it's the, the set one com uh, combined with the image of the three variables through set two combined with the image of the three variables of set four. So this is the core of our of uh, our alpha equivalence then. Um, we can define a remaining function on this raw data type that basically just uh, maps the function over both the bound and the three positions and recursively does so as well. Um, for technical reasons, we need to do use two maps, uh, but we can then use mapconf to basically get this rule what we actually want. And there again is our map restrictions involved. So we need small support and we need to have bijections. Um, and then we can define alpha equivalence as this, in fact, co-inductive predicate. Um, co-inductive because it works for both inductive and co-inductive types, and then you only have to prove it once. Basically means if there is a function that leaves the three variables in the recursive set alone, and the two presets are equal, and we can rename the bound variables and do so and, and then the recursive sets are out equivalent either after renaming or directly, then two constructors are alpha equivalent. Using this alpha equivalence now, we can prove the, that it is a equivalence relation. And we can also prove other health dilemma that if two ter terms are alpha equivalent, they have the same three variables, which is a good uh, to have a piece of mind. And we can also define the quotient on our raw data types on alpha equivalence. So now we have a term type that is sadly not this nice bounded natural functor anymore. So now we need to work a lot to recover this nice property so we can again nest it and use it in other data types. Um, yeah, one problem is that we need a map function. So let's let's just use the rename function we defined earlier. The problem is it has this bijection criteria uh, assumption here. And as we saw earlier, this assumption is only on bound position. So this requires us to basically say that this position is bound. So we couldn't have a term having three variables, which does not make sense. We wanted to represent the three variables in, in our syntax. So we need to somehow get rid of this bijection criteria. And for this is, uh, sorry, that comes later. Um, we need basically a, another map function that doesn't have this. Come back to that. Um, but we can already get some nice induction principles. This is the most general one. I will not go over that in detail, but this is a nice one that is often very useful. So we have a static set that just needs to be smaller than our free variables. So again, we need to be able to get more free very uh, more fresh variables. Um, and inductively, you see here, if it's something in the bound variables, it will not be in that set which is exactly where the variable convention comes in. And as well, if it is in the bound set, it will not be in the free set. So these two together is the variable convention. Bound variables are always different from free variables, and we can avoid arbitrary sets of variables. This version I saw earlier is just allows you to change the set in the recursion, which is nice if you have uh, if you need to generalize your induction principle. Um, so now we want to prove the axioms, and we could say, oh, let's use the rename function and the free variable function as so this would be our set function that extracts all the elements of this A. And this would be a map function, but again, this bijection criteria is wrong. So we need to get something that does not have that. And this is where the recursor comes, and that's what I've been implementing for the last few months. Um, so given some parameter type that we can extract variables from and we can map over it and some target type uh, that we can also extract variables from map over it and it has some constructor um, that gets the parameters here as a thing that's parameter type is basically to get rid of um, problems with um, contra variance so we want to extract the variables and avoid the variables in the parameters which you couldn't do because this would be in a negative function position. This is basically just to work around that. But this constructor basically allows us to implement a fold. We just, this is the argument we give to our fold and the recursor we get out of that is the complete function implemented as a fold. Um, we additionally, we can add, uh, say, a, a static set that should be avoided in the recursive uh, function definition. 
This is technically not needed because we can instantiate this parameter type with a singleton type, but it's much easier to just build it into the whole thing as well. And uh, once we have this, there are some actions involved, but then we can get a unique function that avoids the variables. So this retard on us is not relevant. And with this, we can now get variable for variable substitution. So we define a type of small support functions and instantiate our recursor with that. So we use these small support functions as our parameter type, the support of the functions, as well as the image of, on, uh, of the support. And we can define this as our mapping. Our target type will again be just a term type, so nothing fancy there. So we ignore those extra parameters. We don't need that extra generality that the recursor gives us. And basically just map over the whole thing. And with this, we get our variable for variable substitution function, which we then can use as a um, as a as a map function because it only requires small support and not no longer the bijections. So where are we in this whole thing? Um, at the bottom of this is the whole MRV net actualization. So this is what gives you, you give it the definitions, get the goals for the axioms and all the derived theorems from that. That is done, that works. On top of that is the composition algorithm to build bigger data MRV nests or smaller ones. That was my master thesis, that is also done. And the fixed point was not done by me, but I fixed it and integrated in the whole thing that's also working. The recursor is working for one case or from, yeah, a single case. So the recursor at the moment only works if you have a single kind of variable. So it can implement the lambda calculus. It can't implement a uh, system F yet because you can't have two different kinds of variables, so type variables and value variables. I'm almost done with that. It's almost working for more than one variable. And the core recurse is not implemented at all. So it's not possible to define binding codata types yet. But you can use the normal codata types that Isabel has and bind through those. So you can't have to define a new data type that binds stuff, but you can still use code, uh, infinite types in your construction. On top of that, the variable variable substitution is working. Um, that gives us a map function, and with the map function, you can prove all the axioms again. The term for variable substitution is basically another instantiation of the recursor. I have all the proofs done. I just need to automate them. And this, uh, and then the high level sugar, you see the syntax sugar you saw at the beginning, that is not done at all. That will be, that will be last when all the rest is done. It is you will without it as well. Um, so at the moment, we are sitting at roughly 10K lines of code, of ML code that implement us without the other proofs that are involved. Um, and around 6,000 of those are written by me. Maybe this changed already. I don't know. This does not include all the reused code uh, in, from the Isabel standard library. So the code that implements actually the data types. So we have basically first the raw data types. This is on top of that, which is also roughly another 10K lines of ML code. And just some statistics on like the most of this was done for the paper they wrote for Popo and then fixed up for the fixed point. Again, I fixed here some tactics and integrated into the larger whole. And then the, the uppermost that are um, done by me. This was another bachelor student started on that, but uh, basically only got the conditions working, none of the tactics. Yeah. <laughs> so to summarize all of that. Um, there is different representations. In my opinion, uh, the normal approach is the one that is more general and can easily accommodate more than one um, target formalization. Um, we have a rough understanding what the MRB net is now. Uh, you see that data types can be defined as a composition of these uh, mathematical objects. Um, you can define recursive data types. You have three variables that we can define as an inductive predicate. You get strong induction principles and you have vector variance substitution. Yes, so now I'm open for any questions. Yes. Um, I'm going to have two questions for you. My, my first one is I, I want to apologize that I'm a, a bit dumb. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying I want to come to a talk that you're probably going to give next summer for your, your end of your. Um, Mm -hmm. And I want to 
I, I'm wondering if I can persuade you to take this kind of talk and turn it into something that only has concrete examples of specific things rather than an abstract framework so is a chance to like mm -hmm. to understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Because that would be I I I really I think you this is probably great stuff, but I, I couldn't get any of it. Okay. I will show a concrete example in a minute. Uh, just okay. invisible. But, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm sort of saying is yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping for a, a an entire talk of just concrete examples. Okay, I can do that. Um, because I'm I'm dumb. I'm sorry. That's fine. <laughs> now, my second question is yeah. um, I'm wondering if you how you would go about um dealing with um a calculus where you've got let recs yes and um ordinary bindings yeah and and you want to work basically modulo the reordering of the let recs and and, and yeah. possibly even equivalents <laughs> of, of different separate presentations of, of things that can be thought of as infinite trees how, how would, would this be a good framework for that yeah so the infinite trees is exactly one thing that they had in their proper paper as motivation uh, because you can define a binding code data type that can handle that mm -hmm. and the other thing is you can for the for the non-repetitive thing you can if you have a quotient that you can prove the axioms for, you can use it and recur through mm -hmm. it. So that's how we can do it. So for a paper that uh, we will hopefully get uh, ready for ICFP, uh, we will implement basically an infinite let rec. And so um, Dimitri uh, formalized um, a infinite, a possibly infinite list of non-repeating. Uh, so basically the DA list type we saw earlier, but mm -hmm. as a code data type. And that just works, and you, you can that already works. You can include that, get infinite, possibly infinitely many um, variables in the left bindings, in the left rec, uh, that all bind recursively in each other and themselves, and with, with none of them being repetitive. And so, repeated binders. So, you know, the same variable names twice. That all works already. I'm wondering how you would implement pattern matching rewriting on that kind of stuff. So the thing is about you saw that this uh, the whole type uh, only has this this one constructor, mm -hmm. and the constructor the user wrote are then recovered as definitions on top of those, and all the so basic pattern matching. There's one theorem that says for every data type you can con you can express it as the constructor of the pre data type, and from that you can then derive the the, the pattern matching by basically saying okay the the user had three definitions. And we can, they we know they are total because of how we construct the data type. And we can derive this from this one theorem that we also already have, can derive from the pattern matching. And the pattern matching is nothing else than basically a theorem that says, given this, we can, it's either this or this or this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have two questions. Yes. Uh, I'm curious about, uh, so in, in your last slide, you showed this big graph, and at yeah. the bottom of it, had Axiomatization of MRBNF. So I'm just curious, are these specifications of these types axiomatized or are they defined in the Isabel sense? Like are they a extension of Isabel or are they conservative? They they don't they don't define anything new. So axiomatization, it's not it doesn't introduce new axioms. Yeah, okay. It's so just like asking. you give you give that piece of code your definitions <laughs> and you spit out the axioms instantiated for your types and for your uh, definitions. Yeah. And then you need to prove them. Yeah. But yeah, there's no, in this whole thing, there's no new axioms okay. introduced. Yeah. It's just right. normal Isabel Hall extended further. Okay. And then I'm curious about like, uh, so you showed like some examples of some data types defined this. Yeah. Um, and it makes me think about, so other right. examples of where I've seen that in Isabel. And I, I think I recall seeing a, uh, an implementation of Isabel Pure in Isabel Hall, essentially. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I'm guessing that surely you have to talk about binding at some point um, when you're talking about all of those terms of Isabel Pure. So do you know anything about that and how um, this stuff is different? I don't know about that specific thing, but I know that Isabel internally uses this is yeah, what exactly. it's So I would expect that it makes sense to also use the Brown indices in any kind of verification. Yeah. But of course, you could use this as well. But this, because, would, you, would you say that this is, is, is much better than using the Brown? Not for this case, because it's very simple. Like Isabel has no complex binders. Yeah. Like Isabel is a very simple extension of, it's a polymorphic lambda calculus. So there is no 
co uh, com uh, complex blindness that going on there. So, but, so, so it matters to have a system like this because you not know, all of your systems have night binders like Isabel. I mean, of course, night but this automates a lot of the stuff for you, and you don't need to deal with the like with the brown indices. You always need the the, the, the shifting of binders is yeah. always there. Yeah. It's not something you can absolutely ignore. When this is done, you don't need to care about variables anymore. Like you get the the the, the, the induction theorems that already avoid everything you want to avoid. Um, so it just works, and you can do it like a normal pen and paper proof. That's the goal at least. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, I was just quickly show um basically an example of <clears throat> this in Isabel. So let me scroll to the very very top. Um, when I find my mouse, yes, here. So this is basically the whole file is a proof of the simply type lambda calculus. Come on, God, why is it so slow? Okay, let's just do it. Uh, pro uh, progress and preservation, sorry. Type soundness. So at the beginning, this is, uh, we, we define uh, just the types, which is a normal usable data type. Um, and then here, as I said, I haven't implemented any fancy syntax. So just like we saw earlier in the presentation, we have some the, the three variables or application of two recursive occurrences or a binding occurrence of the variable plus a byte plus a binding recursive occurrence. And then we call some code that creates our recursive data type. So this will always be hidden under the fancy syntax. And comments are the, are the fancy syntax that you would have. What the, the one, the, the, the same one as we had on this first slide. This in this presentation, you're showing stuff in comments that look, looks like the fancy syntax. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what you're hoping to have at some point, but you don't have it yet. No, I haven't implemented that yet, but it's not hard to get. Okay. So I basically need to copy that from the. But basically, I'm, I'm just wondering if I'm interpreting the, the slides correctly. Yeah, no, it's exactly. It will be look. It will look like this, but it's just not the implementation is not okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm interpreting them correctly. Yeah, yeah. This is just for now. This is how I do it, but eventually it will look like in the slides earlier. Mm -hmm. So at this point, we have already um, this data type, and it will give you uh, all the the axioms and uh, the, the theorems. And because I haven't automated term for variable substitutions, so also this is here where the fancy syntax comes in. We, we recover this is basically what goes on in behind with the uh, constructors. So we still have only one constructor, this term C for, but we can define the constructors the user wanted to write as definitions based on the tree data type and the, the single data constructor. Uh, again, this is to be automated as part of the syntax. And then, as I said, because we don't have, um, I don't autumn, I haven't automated all these proofs yet. This is a lot of proofs um, to get term for variable substitution. And yeah, here you see some more ML code. This is what actually then gives us the term for this is ML. This is just basically calling the axiomatization of the recursor with the Actions for the parameter and for the target type and the parameter type. And from this, we get then a recursive function again that automatically avoids variables and does the term for variable renaming and substitution as we want. And we need to just man massage this a bit more to get nicer simplification rules. And at the very end, no, not at the very end, here. At some point, we can then define. Um, a small step relation, a small step semantic uh, for this uh, lambda calculus and uh, some typing relation. So, if we have an application of a function, we substitute. This is where our term for variable substitution function comes in that we used uh, the last uh, thousand lines or so to obtain. Um, and if we can step the value, the application can be stepped as well. Um, same here with the inductive type. I use the type of, um, of finite sets. So it's again not a standard data type, but it is a BNF because it's a finite set, so it has a bound. Uh, and for context, the rest is very much the same. Then 
again, I need some more proofs to get some, um, this is basically equivariance proofs. So if we rename in the, if the, the, the pattern relation holds, it also holds it for rename in, in both the context and the expression. This is all also all to be automated. And from this, we can get um, a better induction. Uh, so we have already implemented the nice induction theorems for data types itself, but we also want better induction theorems for inductive definitions. So in this case, especially here, um, this clause that we, in our abstraction case, in our inductive uh, definition, we want to be able to avoid arbitrary sets in the variables. And this, again, takes a while. A, a long while. And from this, the second version of the, no, come on. This is the second version of the theorem we also saw earlier in the, in the slides, where we have just have one fixed set and we can avoid the fixed set and also the context and also the free variables of the term. So this is a, for the most use cases where you don't need this set to change in the uh, induction, this is fine We avoid the context and the free variables, um, but sometimes we need the more general one as well. So this is then easy. We get some inversion rules that also avoid variables. Again, this is all to be uh, done. And the nice thing now is I implement this binder induction uh, proof method. So this is what then the user at this. So the, the user would write this part. Everything above you saw now is still to be automated. And this is what the user actually wants to prove. So for example, if you have a convex invariance lemma, if you have a typing relation, and for all the three variables in that term, and um, if the context agree on those, then this new context also implies um, that the expression has the same type. Yes? Can I ask a question? Yes. How much of like all of background would the user basically need to know when they actually use the development? I like for example, yeah, like, I like didn't confidence mind. I do that for example as someone who's strong on the data instead of like program correct preservation. They could use it. I'm pretty sure they would be able to. Uh, there's the, the, the whole uh, DNF, uh, I didn't learn about like the moments of our data types already use DNS. I didn't learn about DNS until I started working on the guts of this implementation. So it already works for normal data types very well, but no one needs to know how it works. They just get very nice induction theorems and very nice uh, other like helper theorems and duplication uh, rules. And they don't need to care for all matter uh, for all intents and purposes. They look like built-in data types that you can't inspect. I think, I think it's all in the proof method. Yeah. If the binder induction is intuitive, yes, then you know no one needs to look under the proof. Yes, this binder induction. Why why we need another? This, this there is already an induction method, of course, in Isabel. This binder it gives you this extra clause. So to be able to prove this, we want to avoid any variables that might already be in the second context. And we also need this context to be generalized in the induction. So what this gives us, if we go here, and this is not too slow. Come on. So if we look at what the induction gives us here, it gives us exactly this extra assumption that a normal induction wouldn't give us. So we now know that this avoids really all the free variables in, in gamma. And it also figures automatically out what are the free variables of gamma. So in this case, this is the expression that expects all those. So the F set is converts a, um, is the set function of the F set DNF. And then because it's a set of pairs and the variables are in the first part of that pair, we expect the, the first component of that uh, pair and the union of that is all the three variables in the context. So it, it automatically finds out where are the variables in that. Again, this is position based. So we extract the correct uh, data types through that and we avoid it. So we can use this in proofs. Um, in this case, this is a method proof, which is a sure sign that I did not write this proof on my own. I stated, I want this goal to hold put my cursor there 
and press the sledgehammer button. And then a few seconds later, sledgehammer comes up with proof. I accept it and I have proven this. So this is where, again, the nice Isabel automation comes in. I don't need to know. I can look at the theorems that sledgehammer uses for the proof, um, but also I don't have to. You don't worry about the, the amount of time that it might take for these scripts to load when people use set package. Um, no, because uh, most of them they like they, they can build a heap. Like yeah. same yeah. with nominal two. Nominal two would take a long time if you reload it again in every yeah. session. But Isabel allows you to basically build a pre-compiled, pre-proven heap of a of a package and then start from there. So that's not a problem anymore. The only thing that then consumes time is actually running the data type definition, but that should be rather fast. I mean it's currently not optimized at all, and there's some very low hanging fruits. Yeah. And yeah, so there's other theorems we can prove substitution as well. And at the end, we have progress and preservation. Um, this time, not even using the fancy binder induction, but just normal induction because we don't have variables in our context. Proof is with the empty context. Um, and uh, yeah, the proof runs through. Um, again, using uh, sometimes using some fancy proof methods for SMP uh, users. In this case, Verit, but it could also use set three um, to, to prove this step. Um, but you got that from Slug right? Yeah, yeah. I just pressed again, give me a proof. And in this case, it didn't came up with a Metis proof, but only the SMP proof. Um, but yeah, I can accept that. And the SMP is over. And, and I'm noticing you're using these um, as inject functions and stuff. I'm getting that they're the operators from the type definition. Uh, well, no, they're. Is that because it's closure? Or? Yeah, so um, a normal injection theorem would be uh, for normal data types, but yeah, if the two constructors agree, the inners agree. Mm -hmm. The thing is that is not true if you have something that binds variables, because it might be yeah. the constructors are only equal up to remaining. Yeah. So I can derive this, this app inject that you noticed, uh, or let's go to apps inject directly. It's basically a theorem I derived, come on, jump piece there, yeah. The theorem arrived, uh, I derived from the more general injection theorem on the single constructor. They says two abstract, again, this is not a constructor, it's just a definition on this one single data type constructor. Is equal if there exists a rejection that leaves most of the, uh, like a, that leaves a few variables alone, where you can rename the first part and the, the, the types are equal, and you can rename the expression to be the other expression. That is, we don't get, that's just how, uh, yeah, because they're only up to remaining. So I, I was confused. I realized now that that apps constructor is for constructing lambda. So yeah, yeah, sorry. Apps is getting confused between Isabel's apps and wrap. Ah, ah, yeah, no, no, no. It is, sorry, I, I named apps the, the lambda constructor. You don't work with the quotient directly yeah, at all. Yeah. 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 Do you have a, an example of a kind of syntax with, with binding of some sort that your, your method will not be applicable to, which will be difficult? I'm not sure. At least I'm not aware of any that would struggle that are currently expressible in any other, because it is very much a generalization of most of what is there. Okay, so, so, you... so I have an example ah. that I haven't tried on Yum. So, um, <laughs> yes. Um, just to say what flashed up while you were talking and answering Kieran's question and thinking about Joe's. Um, Matthew's had to go. The recording is carrying on, but will someone else terminate the recording at the end of the film? Okay. Um, Pobble Mark. Yes. The, the part of Pobble Mark that people have never really dealt with is um, row binding, 2D. Where you have where you, where you have binders for records <clears throat> which are not alpha convertible binders, but but field names are special in programming language syntax, as I know you know, Joe, mm -hmm. because they both have a binding role with respect to the types that are associated with them, but they're not renameable. So they they have different different dynamics. And I would uh, so, yes. I... so we we sketched how we would prove this, and we can extract those patterns into an oh because at the moment okay the, the construction does support mutual recursive types, 
It's just in my implementation, this is not done yet. So, but, but it's can, not the new term. Yeah, yeah. It's a different status of variable. I know. Sets. But it should be possible. We okay. have tried it because we first want to have yeah, all yeah. of that yeah. big chunk of, like this file is over 2,000, uh, over 1,500 lines of code long. First, I want to have the bunch of most of that gone by automation before I then do stuff. Like this was nice as a to, to try it out to see if it really works, to see it working the first time. But it's very much not production ready to say at the moment. At first, needs the term for variable substitution very much needs to be automated first. Yeah. So before asking Jan to solve a problem that is not well solved elsewhere in the literature. I would say C of Popple Mark TB is an instance that meets your requirements. And, and, and a risk of sort of moving the discussion a little bit of track. Do you think, James, that this has something to do with uh, the sort of renamings that you're allowed or not allowed to do? Uh, I don't know. Okay, well, I don't know. The talk about problem arc TV will be a separate area of work. Well, let's talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm just curious. We, we got into a problem recently when trying to um, do some simply type stuff with type variables. Yeah. Where when we were trying to do type substitutions on uh, alpha equivalence classes, um, they ended up being strange because of the way that variables are implemented in Isabel, uh, where they're just a pair of the variable, yeah. uh, variable name and their type. So I'm just wondering if you've come across that problem when you've been uh, implementing stuff here. I, but I know it's a new thing like typing context for the type of terms rather than building the. Yeah, yeah, so this is right. like everything here is not basically um, the, the typing is not part of the Isabel so it's completely so above that. We define this. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I, so it's like the, the, but I mean, like when you come to formalizing a syntax where your yeah. variables have these type variables in them, and then you're trying to form substitution on bound variables that have type variables in them. Um, the, the issue is that um, in some presentations, people like to put the types into the variables so that variables have an intrinsic type. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you'd be able to say anything about, I think Karen was basically asking if you can say anything about this, this case where variables have a type built into them. Yes. As opposed to getting a type from the context. Um, yeah, so the thing is what I may, might not be clear is um, here at the top, if you see, um, I only specify a, 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 basically a, a Isabel variable on the functor for the um, type of variables. Yes. I never actually fix what the variables are. Yeah. So you can implement basically it could put there a a type that has yeah, intrinsic that that of a name in it. And, and this name. can again be a binding data type without problem. The only thing it needs to uh, be able to do is needs to be big enough so you can get no fresh variables, which shouldn't be a problem if well, you have a the, the issue is that sometimes when you've got a variable, variables of two different types, yes, that have type variables in the right types. Yeah. And yeah. you're substituting types for the type variables, they might have the same type afterwards. Yes. And and then they're so so there's, there's, there's three types, type one, type two, and type three. Yes. And type three is the result of instantiating a variable in type one, and yes. also it's the result of instantiating a different variable in type two. Yes. So you've got two term variables of, of type type one and type two. Yeah. And they can both end up being mapped by type type substitution into type three. Yes. And so you've got all of the variables of type one and all of the variables of type two have to be mapped into the same set type three. Yeah. And you can get interesting clashes happening. Yeah, and what the alpha equivalents and the renaming, you should avoid automatically all the variables. Right, but these are free variables. Yeah, but if they are equal, they need to be the same anyways. But I'm not sure I'm following completely. So we'll, we'll have to give you the example afterwards. Hmm? Uh, Kieran and I will, will show you the example. After. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like I'm not completely following the problem. It, it, I think it should take some time to yeah, yeah. understand what, what the issue is. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Okay. Two comments in the chat, but they're probably not oh. these. Uh, uh, there are no other questions and stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was indeed Matthews. Yeah, cool. Then uh, thank you for listening. 
And yeah, I hope I can finish this somewhere soon. <laughs> taking a, I'm, I've been at it since October, not last year, the year before, since I started my master's. So yeah, this has dragged on a lot. But now, I guess the first time, this five wasn't possible before because all the parts were not coming together. But now that everything is coming together and it's working, um, it is very much a good, good progress at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. Stop the recorder. Uh, your face. Yes, yes. I'm just calling for your face. Well, uh, <laughs>